Let's get back then to, 18, uh, to the 1800s and the uh, early 1900s here in Prince Edward County. What would life have been like back then? Well, uh, it was, as I mentioned earlier, a farming area. Uh, and so if you wanted to imagine what a successful farm would look like, say, in the late 1800s, this would be a farm that's been in the family for multiple generations, uh, that has been fairly successful. What you would probably find is you would find a house that had originally been made of wood and probably converted to brick. You would have had a wooden barn out the back, increasingly uh, better built than uh, with each generation that passes on the farm. You would have probably had a piggery, uh, some coops for poultry. You would have had some small livestock being kept like sheep or goats. You would have had some dairy cattle, maybe a few beef cattle as well. You would have had gardens that were close to the house to grow fruits and vegetables for the family's immediate consumption. You would have had some fields out behind the barn where grain was grown, grains like barley, like rye, wheat, corn, and so on, and you would have had some pasture. And the farm would have been worked, the labor power would have been provided by the people who lived on the farm and draft animals, originally oxen, and then as the family became better off, draft horses probably. Now, that, what I've described there, is a fairly successful farm that's been in the family for a number of generations, but that wouldn't have been the only type of farm here in the county. There would have been a lot of uh, smaller enterprises as well, more modest homes, uh, smaller farms with maybe a small number of fields, small number of livestock, and the people who lived in these farms, uh, many of them would have worked off the farm as well, in fishing, in cutting wood, and so on, to earn their livelihoods, and you would have had a higher turnover of people living in those sorts of smaller farms. In the late 19th century, railroads were built in eastern North America, and some of those rail lines would reach the county as well, uh, and would provide an alternative means of transportation to the boats and the poor roads that I described earlier. The other thing that's important to think about in terms of 19th century farm life and rural life is that families were large. People would have had many children, and so all along the highways here, every few miles, you would have had, for example, a schoolhouse to educate these kids. People would have socialized primarily within their large families and with their immediate friends and neighbors who lived in the same vicinity because of the poor roads uh, and so on. So people who spent a lot of time on the farm, Sundays they would have probably gone to church, maybe had social events in the community once in a while, maybe gone to market and so on. But what happened was that people spent a lot of time close to home. The food that they would have consumed would have been primarily food that they themselves or their neighbors or other people in the community produced. There were not many uh, items that you would have consumed in the home that weren't self-produced or locally produced. The exceptions being things like non-perishable goods like sugar, coffee or tea and so on that would have been brought in by boat. Otherwise you would have been eating locally. The clothes that you wore, with the exception of a, perhaps a good suit of clothes that you would wear to church, to weddings, to funerals and so on, the clothes that you would have worn would have probably been made by, uh, by the mother of the household who would have made them out of raw cloth that she would have bought in the village at the local store. Now remember that up until about World War I or World War II, depending on where you lived, you wouldn't have had access to electricity or to electrical lights uh, or to refrigeration or even telephones or things like that. So life was much quieter and local, if you will, in that period of time. Now, because of that, the human relationship with nature would have been very different than the way it is today in Prince Edward County. The 19th century farm, your relationship with nature would have been very visceral, very tangible. In other words, what was happening was that every member of the family would have had daily ongoing interactions with the natural environment. Everybody in the family would have been familiar with working with animals, with uh, planting seeds and watching them grow, with understanding how cattle give birth to calves and so on. Um, everybody would have you know, seen a chicken laying an egg and today that's not something that we're all that familiar with most people. On the farm here in the 19th century you would have gotten much of your sugar from tapping maple trees out in the woodlot. So people were actively involved with nature in a much different way than they are today. They would have been cutting wood, they would have been drawing water from wells, there weren't many doctors or hospitals in this part of the world at that time, so many of the medicines that you would have used would be home remedies, often from wild gathered plants and roots and so on. And the people who lived here would have, would have been able to interpret the weather 
to understand what was going on with nature simply through direct observation by observing the movement of the wind and the clouds, uh, by looking at the changes in the wildlife and in the vegetation and so on. So a very different uh, relationship between people and nature in 19th century Prince Edward County. As you can see, I've changed locations. I'm still in Wellington, but I'm no longer over on the beach. Instead, I'm in the village standing in front of an abandoned canning factory. Now, the reason I'm doing so is to talk about a transition that took place in the early 20th century here in the Prince Edward County in terms of how rural livelihoods changed. Uh, World War I and World War II had a big impact on rural Canada and particularly rural Prince Edward County because there was a few things that went on. One was that prior to World War I, most people sort of lived and worked and socialized and traveled in local regions and long distance travel was fairly rare. But with World War I, you had large numbers of young men who were leaving the countryside and traveling overseas to serve and those who did come back uh, brought with them new ideas, new cultures and so on. The other thing that's important about the war periods is that it changed the way farming was thought of. Farms had to become part of a larger enterprise, a larger effort to mobilize resources for the use, for, uh, for the use of uh, the military service for conducting the war and so on. So what happened was there was more importance in terms of getting food from the farm and distributed more widely. And so you had a lot of mechanization that was taking place on the farms, horses being replaced by tractors, and horses being replaced by pickup trucks and so on. And you also had a change in the way food was distributed as well. And one of those was through industrial canning. Uh, people had always canned food to preserve food for use in the winter time. Uh, after all, up until the 1940s or so, not everybody had uh, refrigeration or electricity. So people would take the harvested food and they would put it in glass jars and can it and store it through the winter. Well, what took place in the early 20th century was an effort to have industrial canning, where you actually had companies that were coming in and establishing canneries like this to put the produce in tin cans for shipment elsewhere. Now, we don't have, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there are any working canneries today in Prince Edward County. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is that people don't eat tinned food anymore. Uh, you can go into a grocery store in January and buy a fresh peach or a fresh strawberry that's brought in from South America. So unless your tastes run to uh, preserve food, there's not really any need to buy it anymore. The other thing is that uh, present day industrial canning factories require a lot more food uh, to be brought into them uh, to, to operate successfully, much more food than can be produced here in Prince Edward County. So most of the tinned food that you would eat today uh, is brought from other parts of the world, even foods that we could grow and can here in Southern Ontario. So what is a farm like in Prince Edward County today? Well, there's a variety of different types of operations, but one of the more common types is one where the farmer has field crops of corn and soybeans supplemented by some hay or other pasture crops. Now the corn and the soybeans are not really grown for table product or for table consumption. They're more for processing and, and onward food production. So for example, the corn will be going into things like syrup or sweeteners or starches or even into ethanol that will be used for a gasoline supplement. And the soybean again is used for food processing or livestock food. In fact, the distant field over my right shoulder is a soybean crop that is almost ready for harvest. Now, there are other farms that will have dairy cattle or beef cattle. There's some poultry operations, some hog and sheep farms as well. What you will find is that the type of farming we have today in Prince Edward County is much more specialized than it was a hundred years ago where the farm family was growing a mix of, a diversified mix of foods, uh, some for their own consumption and only a little bit for onward sale. The other characteristic you'll find on farms in the county today is that there's relatively little year-round labor. Now most of the farms are family owned and operated, but beyond the fa immediate family, uh, they only bring in labor when it's needed and often this labor comes from overseas, from the Caribbean or from Central or South America. Farmers in the county are getting older and that's pretty common across rural North America. Young people leave the farm, they go off to study, to college, to university, and they tend not to come back. Again, because there's not a lot of need for labor on the farm. The average age of farmers is going up, and many farmers are actually getting out of the business altogether, which means their lands are being sold or rented to neighboring farmers. 
one of the realities of farming is that farmers tend to have a lot of money tied up in their land or their equipment. They tend not to have a lot of cash flow in terms of cash income from their crops. And when it does, it varies a lot from one year to the next. So it's not a very easy business to get into if you're not already part of it uh, through your family. Now, there's a phenomena that's happened in the last 20 or 30 years or so here in the county that's changing the look of farming. And it's not traditional farming like I've just described, but it's a growth in small-scale market gardening of fresh fruits and vegetables, orchards, vineyards, and an agritourism industry is booming as well. You'll recall earlier I told you that there's an ideal mild climate here and good soils for agriculture. It's very good for producing soft tree fruits, blueberries, and growing grapevines, and indeed that's what you see growing right behind me here. Now those conditions of soil and climate always existed here, so what happened in the last 20 or 30 years to uh, spark this interest in things like grapes? Well, three social phenomena that happened in North America have probably contributed to this. One is that over the last generation or two, North Americans have switched their consumption of alcoholic beverages from hard liquor and beer to more wine. And so that's one thing that's going on. The second is, more recently, an interest in local food and maybe you've heard of the 100 mile diet. There's a lot of culture going around into better quality food consumption. And the third phenomena, social phenomena, is something that social scientists sometimes call the pre-elderly phenomena. This is people in their 50s or 60s who are getting closer to retirement and who are in very good health, who are very active, and also have a lot of disposable income and want to participate in activities like wine tasting and rural agritourism and so on. And so these are three cultural phenomena that are changing the way the land is used here in Prince Edward County. And the county has a great set of environmental conditions to set the stage for an economy where tourists can come in and visit the county and eat great local food, have a glass of wine, a very good glass of wine, and then go for a walk on a beach. And there's not too many places in Ontario where you can do those three things. What we're getting, therefore, is a different rural society today. You're getting an influx of people, both the visitors and the residents in the county who are perhaps pre-elderly, who perhaps come here to start a vineyard or to start an orchard. They're not part of the traditional farming community here. And so it creates a new sort of society here. And sometimes those things worked well, sometimes they don't. For example, here in the county right now in the summer of 2012, there's a great controversy over wind turbines. There are many long-standing family farmers who've lived in this county for generations who are planning to rent their land to industrial companies that want to put up large wind turbines. And then the landowner will get some rent for that. Whereas the people who own the vineyard, the vineyards, the wineries, and so on, they're a little bit less keen about wind turbines. They're worried about the effects it'll have on agritourism. Will it be visual pollution? Will people not want to come to the county if there's a lot of wind farming going on? So there's a lot of sort of uh, disagreement and even small-scale conflicts in certain parts of the county over how the land should be used and what's the appropriate way to do things. Another thing that's changing is the nature of the villages and towns in the county as well. In the village of Wellington that I showed earlier, you can't buy a liter of gasoline. There's no gas station. But there are three fancy restaurants where you can buy a non-fat latte and a very good meal. And so what is happening is that the types of services being provided in the towns and villages are catering more to the new resident and the visitor and less to the established resident who simply wants to buy a liter of gas and uh, a bag of groceries.